Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you declare your almighty power chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Grant us the fullness of your grace that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of Numbers. The rabbi among, the, among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, if only we had meat to eat. You remember that the fishes we used to eat in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to, be, to look at. Moses heard the people weeping through the, their, throughout their families, all the entrances of the tents. Then the Lord became very angry, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servants so badly? Why have I found, not found favor in your sight, that your lay burden 
that you lay the burden of all this uh, and all the people on me. Did I conceive all this? Did I conceive all the people? Did I give birth to them that they should say to me, carry them in your bosom as the nurse carries a suckling child to the land that you promised on the earth to their sisters? Who am I to get meat to, to give to all the people? For they come weeping to me and say, give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all the people also alone, for they too are too heavy for me. If this is the way you are going to get to treat me, put me to death at once. If I have found favor in your sight, and do not make, let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, gather for me the 70 of, of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people, and offer over, to, over them Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them t take the place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered several elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was in him and put it on the seven day elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Ehud, Eldred, and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them, and they were among those registered, but they had gone out to the tent and they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, an assistant of Moses, on his, one of his chosen men said, my Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, are you jealous for my sake? With all the Lord's people would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and the Lord would put the Spirit on me, on, on them, on them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from James. Are any of you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with the oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them, raise them up, and anoint them. No, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from the wandering will save the other's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Lord, to Lord, you, Lord Christ. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. 
but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourself and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the med meditations of our hearts be gracious and pleasing in your sight, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We learned today that that particular prayer comes from the psalm as we sang. And we also learned from the Old Testament passage that we have both a Spaniard and an Irishman, El Dad and Mi Dad, in the scriptures. Scriptures are always a lot of fun. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. In my college biology class, one of the first questions that was posed to me was less about the science and more about the philosophy. I remember our professor asking, what is life? And lots of responses naturally emerged. People said things like something, you know, an organism that can move and do things, or something that can think and make decisions, or something that can eat and drink or have babies, self-replicate. Self and the professor gathered all of these responses and eventually said, well, but what about you? Can we turn that inside out and say, what can we take away from you before you are no longer living? And the students in the class began imagining hacking off various limbs and whole sections of the body, finally wondering if all you really needed to be alive was a heart and a brain. Until naturally we all realize that there are people who still have a beating heart and a brain with electrical fire on the monitor though with no other signs of life than those reported by bedside machinery. So in light of today's rather gory and unpleasant gospel text, what is the smallest part of us that can be considered alive? Students in my biology class confuse questions of being alive with perceptions of having a life. What the biology professor was finally getting at is that a cell is the smallest unit of life. But today's words from Jesus are trying to push us to ask even more specifically, what is the smallest unit, what is the smallest viable unit of a faithful life, of a life lived in God? How much can I keep and still consider myself a Christian? How much can I hang on to and still arrive at God's promised kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? Is there stuff I should cut off? Last week, our gospel text introduced us to this question by talking about a little child sitting on Jesus' lap in the middle of his disciples having an argument about who's the greatest. And so Jesus puts a child in his lap and says, this is what it looks like to be the greatest. Any questions? Children, who, as we learned last week in the Greek, are called slaves in Jesus' time, were largely invisible, known as those who couldn't pull their own weight, economic liabilities. Jesus says to live God's life with God's eyes, it means welcoming those who live the most bare life, the little people who might not ever pull their weight. To be alive is to take care of the expendable ones. And then we show up this week and Jesus uses this strong, hyperbolic language, exaggerating about life and limb in order to drive home the point about what real whole life is as a way of trying to communicate how in God's world your limbs might be better used for some things than others. You are at your most alive when you lose yourself in caring for those least among us. 
Jesus demands that we imagine what's the very least that I can do and still be one of God's own. I'd like to offer you a dangerous example of one way to answer this question. Dangerous because it speaks to a memory that I have of a past election cycle, and I'd imagine that many of you might try to read my political views into this story. Don't. Because the story really isn't about politics, and I don't endorse political candidates from my pulpit or pastoral office. So with that clear disclaimer in mind, I remember talking with a family member during that election cycle about a decade ago, my dad, who groaned into the phone saying, I cannot believe that either of our candidates are just not Christians. I don't even know how to choose. You might gather that that family member was taking a cheap jab. And I responded, the two candidates at hand were Mitt Romney and Barack Obama. I said, you know, my, in terms of their religious commitments, one is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so more commonly called a Mormon, and the other one is a Christian. Well, my family member said, I know Mitt Romney isn't a Christian, but neither is Barack Obama. I mean, he doesn't act like it and proceeded to tell me about all of Obama's political missteps. What that family member overlooked in his concerns about ideologies and policymaking is that judging the Christian heart by actions alone is a very dangerous thing. It's a sliding scale because our Christian best, our very best, often results in wounded hearts and sometimes mangled bodies. Ask any Christian leader of any organization at any time in the history of the world. Our former president, Obama, was baptized in 1988 at Trinity United Church of Christ, meaning he was put under with God's promise, poured, under, poured on top of him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In that moment, making him an identifiable Christian, given the gift of faith, Baptism made him one who has been claimed by the promises of Christ. And Mr. Obama, just like any other person who comes to the font at our church, just like you, are all swallowed up in grace. In baptism, you are covered by Christ's mercy, granted citizenship and refuge in the kingdom of God. And while I will never commend casting a ballot based on one religious preference or another, I commend it all to your personal voting practices. We are still called to see our brothers and sisters who have been baptized as indeed brothers and sisters in Christ. We are called to see strangely enough through God's eyes. In that very evaluation of Mr. Obama and others, we find the temptation of Jesus' words to look at ourselves and others and wonder how much is Christian or not? How much of the body is oriented like a compass to Christ? How much is not? And if it's not, which sinful parts need to be taken away, hacked off, as it were, to make the relative percentage of Christian go up? Well, if that is Jesus' message to you, to do better, to be better, to try harder, to shape up, to get your act together, then maybe you would end up finding yourself having to take things off in order to rightfully enter God's presence. And if that's the message of Jesus, then the sermon I need to preach today is a threatening shape up or else. But you know what? That's a really bad sermon. <laughs> and so I think that we need to reconsider what Jesus is driving at. The words of amputation come from the same Jesus who said just a few chapters back in Mark, evil comes from the human heart, which is very strange to our contemporary ears because we live in a culture where people say, follow your heart on a regular basis, as if that's a map that makes sense. Because Jesus says tough stuff lives there, evil even. And yet, in today's gospel text, he's not suggesting you amputate, you amputate your heart. He's trying to shock his disciples. He's trying to shock you into a sense of how deep your distrust of God is. That's what he's angling at today. 
And if you, get, if you gather a sense of how deep your distrust for God is, then on the flip side of that, you're going to get a sense of how deep God's grace is going to go for your sake. We like to think that we can guide our hands and our feet and the words of our mouths and the things that we hold in our fingers and the stuff that we gnaw into our hungry bellies, even our own hearts. We like to think that we can maneuver our bodies and our words and our feelings around and out of the way of sin. But the truth is, as Jesus points out, our behavior and our words and our feelings can still cause some serious damage. We like to imagine that it's possible to drive ourselves in the direction of goodness and love. But when we start on that track, we start to imagine that we don't really need all that much saving or grace from God. There are a few better places to identify this passionate urge for self-preservation than in parenting. You all know those helicopter parents who send their kids to school with the rolling backpacks to preserve their spines and who invest in the latest car seat technologies and monitor every little organic bite that their little ones ingest. I might be exhibit A in this practice. <laughs> who send their children to the most private of private preschools in order to launch the earliest possibility of greatness. Oh, but look at my children. I mean, they are perfect. Um, I mean, yet. Just like me, we are the same parents who baptize our children into the promises of Christ Jesus. We bring our children to be washed in God's word, and yet the very last thing that any of us want is for our kids to ever need saving. We work to restrain evil limbs and wayward hearts, like that baptismal candle that was once slid back into the box and packed away in that keepsake trunk. Parents who don't want to believe their children need saving tuck away God's promises for sweet memories and extreme emergencies, and they try to handle the rest themselves. Be good, we tell our kids, and offer enticements to have that happen and make threats in case it doesn't. But the truth is, if we're all honest about ourselves at any age, including our precious little ones, our good hearts and our best intentions are marbled with evil, like fat ribbons and high-quality steaks. Not just around the edges and not in ways that can be easily trimmed away with the right kind of cleaver under the red butcher lights or washed away like dirt off of a body. Sin, what Jesus is getting at today, sin is not some nebulous thing. It's not a spiritual substance that sort of smudges our faces with a ghostly grime or otherwise shrouds our pure souls or can be hacked off like a rotten arm or a wonky leg. No. What we find out, particularly in the readings from James, is that we are shot through with spiritual ills, like laundry lists, like murder, theft, adultery, wickedness, envy, hypocrisy, slander, pride, gossip, greed. And these are all real and ruinous and concrete and credible Yet if Jesus' words today are true, they come part and parcel with the skin we wear and the hearts that beat inside of us, all the way to the tips of our sinning fingers, to the ends of our wayward toes, and into our rolling eyes. And that's why we baptize the whole person at any and every age. Jesus doesn't want to hack things off. Jesus wants to put the whole of you under Baptism saves and protects the whole person. We never simply say, as I will next week, next week we've got a baptism at the 9 o'clock service. We're going to baptize little four-month-old Eric. I'm not going to say, Eric, I baptize your right arm, your left kidney, your brain, and a substantial portion of your heart. No, I'm going to baptize all of him. Because like him, God's promise is applied to all of you, all your limbs, on your whole heart, on everything you are and everything you will be. God's whole promise is stirred indelibly into the water such that you cannot break molecules apart and find something that is amiss with God's promise. In baptism, God washes all of you. God gives whole, God's whole promise to you. Baptism acknowledges this reckless and restless world and all the things that might befall you now and someday. And in this gift, we're honest about what you're up against, which is a world marked by things that wound and scar, sometimes at the hands of others, and sometimes by our own feet, which often like to dance with the devil. In baptism, we declare you are not alone in all this. 
In today's gospel text, Jesus is getting us ready for baptism. After washing our new little ones into the bigger body of Christ, we usually give them a candle. And the Bible verse we read to them is about light shining and good works, which is simply another way of saying, welcome to the storm. Here's your flashlight. It can get pretty dark out there. We don't tell our newest Christians to follow your heart because they'll end up stumbling right into Jesus' words today because hearts get broken, usually by clumsy hands and careless words. To follow your heart would be dangerous and lonely living. To trust your limbs would be catastrophic. But if you cut off your arms, how can you possibly hold your baptismal flashlight? Instead, we give you who are baptized a small flame and we speak words of welcome. We promise that we're in this together with God's promise at the helm, no matter how weird or how hard life gets. Baptism drenches all of you in waters that refresh for a lifetime, enough to carry you through every evil, every division, every disagreement, every judgment, every trial, and every blade that tries to seek to cut you off from this body of God. Baptism calls you back to this place to live with your brothers and sisters, to learn how to guide your body in good and holy and blessed ways together, and to make room for error. To acknowledge that what makes you a Christian, what marks you for God's grace, is finally and only the promise of Jesus Christ. Jesus claims all of you, your hands, your mind, your feet, your heart. And in this way, you who are baptized are guided by so much more, by more than the work of your hands and where you guide your feet. The promise that Jesus Christ makes to you was brought about by his crucifixion, death, and resurrection. All of him died for your sake. All of him was raised for your salvation. And all of you is held in his grace through the gift of his promise. Keep your body together. Don't hack anything off. Because Jesus has claimed you all for promise now and in the life of the world to come. Amen. Please rise as we confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, through him all for things us and for our salvation. For us and he came down our from salvation. Heaven. He By came the down power from of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people, in peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. 
for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Ketlin, our bishop-elect, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in the church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. For Sarah and Megan. For Gabby and Karma in Tucson, Arizona. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. For Eric as he prepares for baptism. We will exalt you, O God our King and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, you know the needs of your church in every place. Look graciously upon us, the people of the Church of the Redeemer, and grant us the guidance of your Holy Spirit as we seek a new rector for this parish. Give us discernment, wisdom, and confidence in your timing. Guide the members of our search committee as they labor to be faithful in seeking your will. We pray for the life of our parish that we may continue to be strengthened in our mission to be Jesus Christ's heart hands and feet to our neighbors, no matter where they are on their journey of faith. Bless us with mutual trust and respect, courage and foresight as you shepherd our community through its journey. All this we ask as we walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please share the peace. God's peace, everybody. God's peace. God's peace, everyone. Peace, everyone. God's peace, Zoom people. God's peace, God's peace Brian. Hi, Francis. Hey, Mertz's. God's peace. God's peace. You may be seated for a few announcements. God's peace, Melanie. First, we want to welcome those of you who are visiting with us today. We're so glad that you are here with us. 
we welcome you to Redeemer and, and we are just delighted to have you in our midst. We also want to greet everyone who is with us online, so turn around and wave to the camera, which is at the top of the arch there. We're glad that you're with us too, in spirit and in virtual body. The single announcement that I do have to share with you today is that Love Teach Heal Academy, which is the lay academy of the Episcopal Diocese of Pittsburgh, is going to start in mid-October. And it is a, an academy that tries to, that aims to teach you uh, some of the internal workings of what we believe and why it matters. And the goal is that you discern leadership in your community. Leadership could mean anything ranging from becoming a reader, preaching a sermon, becoming a teacher, or coming up with a new ministry idea for your parish. You'll be in the same classroom as other people throughout the diocese and people in the Lutheran Synod, since we do this in conjunction uh, with the Lutherans. And the Lutherans are very nice. Um, I, I've seen them before. <laughs> uh, I, I am the one who teaches the class, so it would also give us an opportunity to spend more time together. Uh, the class is on Wednesday evenings from 7.30 to 9. We're going to meet via Zoom uh, up until the point that it is safe for us to meet in person again. And so if you are interested and able, I encourage you to be in touch with me and I will get you the registration forms. The class is free of cost, though it costs a commitment of your time, and you also get free books. So, I mean, if that doesn't entice you, I don't know what will. So I would look forward to having any or even all of you participate in our class. Are there any other announcements you would like to share for the good of the parish? What's that? Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemptional Father in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us be peace. Alleluia.
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and receive them in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. My Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. <clears throat> I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. As though you have already come, I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
Let us pray together. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ is with you and for you. From the tops of your heads to the tips of your fingers and the bottoms of your feet, Jesus Christ loves you and blesses all of you. So go out into the world in peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.